Hi there. I'm Adrian Warnock of Blood Cancer Uncensored, and I'm here with my good friend, Eric, who uh, is launching the fourth uh, segment, if you like, or the fourth blog or the fourth part of Blood Cancer Uncensored, and it's called uh, Planet Health, and uh, it'll be authored by my good friend, Eric. Thanks for joining us, Eric. Great to be with you, Adrian. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, now, Eric, um, just uh, you very kindly agreed to sort of do a little bit of an introduction to us for uh, your section of the of the site. Um, but I wanted to just ask a couple of questions. Um, the whole idea, as I understand it, is that you're wanting to offer a place to explore different ideas about sort of practical implications to try and maintain and improve our health. It doesn't necessarily mean cure our blood cancer, but it might mean improve our own quality of life or how we feel, those kinds of things. So what, what kind of areas do you think that we can really start to consider improving our own health? Well, I simply leave it to, to a category of what I can do at home myself, as opposed to something I have to go and buy or join a club or anything external like that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Um, um, now, there's lots of different ideas, isn't there, that come up? I mean, you read things online and some people, you know, say, oh, it should be this or it should be that. And, um, I'm just wondering, you know, how you uh, get around all of those sort of conflicting ideas yourself. Well, over time, you learn to trust your body and trust your, your own sense of, of uh, harmony and balance. And that is a big part of being healthy. That if we're always waiting for something from the outside to affirm what we can do or should do, we are giving up our own um, personal awareness and personal responsibility to, to determine what is correct. There's nothing that I will say that, that would cause any harm to anybody, but what is appropriate for you today, choices as you learn, learn different things you can do. And much of it is very familiar. So you'll, you'll see as we go along here. Okay. And what should we expect when we make changes? I mean, do, should, do we expect sort of instant improvement or, or perhaps not? Well, when you think about it, uh, we've each got, reached a certain point in life uh, with a certain package of strengths and weaknesses. And that is based on behavior and activities that we've repeated over and over, whether it's the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we eat, what we drink, and so on. So if we're not satisfied with the point we've reached, then it suggests we need to look at changing certain things. So they're all within our daily routines, or not, perhaps there's things we could add to those routines, but the idea is that it's at a personal level, as opposed to a team sport or a uh, a medical intervention or something like that. That's great. I think we're in for a real treat because I mean, I've had a little bit of a sneak preview and some private conversations with Eric about some of the many little tweaks that he's put into his own life and uh, that he's going to offer to us over the coming weeks and, and months perhaps as well. Because uh, I know there's a number of them, that things that don't cost money, things that anyone can do, can sort of pick a mix of the ones that you want to do and you feel you practice a couple um, uh, little tweaks myself and found some benefit and actually we're already doing some and that's one of the interesting things that we found when we've talked to some other people that actually sometimes you know people come across some of these ideas in, in different uh, in, in different ways I mean, I'm seeing a physio at the moment who is talking to me about my breathing for example and I suspect that might be one of the things you you might mention to us um, in this sort of short talk that I'm going to just hand over to you now to, to do thank you Eric Yes, of course. If, if it wasn't familiar, it wouldn't be within the realm of possibility. So we're dealing with our bodies. We all have a, a common uh, physical heritage of uh, the biochemistry of the body and, and the interaction with the environment. So that's a shared thing. And the individual differences are interesting as well. But let's consider the common points first and let each one figure out how they're unique or how their needs might be different than yours and mine. Uh, 
we, we are dealing with uh, the complexity of modern medicine, which has a different language and has all kinds of uh, tests and procedures compared to the simplicity of self-care for health. So uh, it's not a competition because we use medicine in a limited way, certain appointments or tests, and we use self-care every day. It's something we do seven days a week. So it's not, it's not a, um, an opposition to medicine. On the other hand, what, for those who have a diagnosis, uh, there's often the idea that, oh, maybe this will help with this specific condition. And I'm not making any claims in that regard. On the other hand, it takes some personal reason to begin to do something on a regular daily basis uh, if you don't feel like you're seeing um, a dramatic result. Now, I can tell you that over time, some of these things may have a deeper effect than people realize. And some of that might be borne out with lab tests and other measurements. But for now, the person, each person has to say, this is easy to experiment with. I'm just learning things that I can do myself. And if I'm consistent, I may learn some benefits. I may have a particular happy outcome. But if I do it inconsistently, I will learn nothing. So what happens, especially in the face of disease or chronic conditions, the tendency is to ask the question, why? Why me? Why did this happen? Uh, you know, and it's a frustrating question. It doesn't have an easy answer. So we need to go more to the question, how? How can I influence my health? How can I tell how I'm doing? And uh, there's lots of things you can learn in that regard whether it's to do with your energy or your sleep or your appetites or anything that you choose to observe. Now, most people, if you ask, how are you doing? They'll say, I'm fine, except I've got this little pain or an itch or didn't sleep very well last night or I've got some indigestion. So most of those things are what I consider not medically interesting haven't reached the attention of a doctor. They haven't been given a name. It's just the complaints of, of uh, shall we say, residing with this body for a number of years and, and uh, letting it express itself. So the what is something very routine. Like I say, some discomfort or some fatigue or whatever. It's not, it's not a big element. But if it's persistent, then it deserves our attention. So if you reach a point where you're just not happy with your health, then you have to look, what is the reason for you doing this? Some people get out of bed and have to feel they have to eat something right away. Well, that can be a habit because they used to go to work at seven in the morning and now they don't. Or uh, they used to think you had to fuel up like putting gas in a car. And now, now you, you realize you don't have to do that. So you have to examine these sort of patterns and habits that we have. Some of them are where we share a meal with somebody or we share uh, an activity. Others are deep cultural patterns. What's considered desirable? I was talking to someone from Iran the other day and her her comment was, oh, everything that comes out of that culture has to do with meat. And she was thinking of eating less meat. So she had to move away from the culture momentarily to see if she had a choice. Personally, I wasn't commenting on what she was choosing. I was just listening to her. So this term ancestral wisdom is interesting to me. It is something that is been passed on generation after generation for centuries. And if we even think back to our grandparents' time or perhaps their parents' time, things were very different. We had a, uh, uh, a simpler culture then 
people didn't travel so far, they worked locally, they ate locally produced food, they shared meals at the family table, lots of things that have been discarded in the name of progress since. We often refer to ourselves as part of a developed nation or an advanced nation, those of us who are in the, uh, Europe or, or North America, and yet this advancement hasn't necessarily produced health. In fact, quite the opposite. The in incidence of chronic uh, disease is growing dramatically in the last uh, two or three decades. So I reflect on what I remember from my parents and grandparents, and there were lots of things that were very helpful that just take a little time and attention. Um, we have the idea now that things are moving faster that we're getting more done in less time and then we add more activity so when did you first hear the word stress stress was kind of a new concept when hans selye wrote about it in the 1960s and yet everybody uses that word today stress just means not what's happening, but how are you handling what's happening? How are you reacting to what's happening? So each one has to examine that and say, okay, do I have choice here or am I, you know, uh, in a work situation where I have to do a specific task in relation to another worker or a machine or something like that? And we actually have more choice than we realize until we take time to look at it. So, when each person looks at a short list of things that we'll just mention, they can say, oh, I know that already, or that's easy, or that's strange, or I never thought of that. So there's nothing that unfamiliar about the things that I pay attention to. For example, you mentioned breathing. Well, breathing is so automatic that most people don't think about it. And then one day they take a yoga class or they go to a physiotherapist and they learn something different about breathing. So breathing is a combination of relaxation and expansion and, 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 and compression and expansion, you know, as, as the body um, interacts with the external environment. Well, most of the time, waking or sleeping, it's happening automatically but there's some very specific things we can learn so that our breathing enhances the way our cells operate. And our cells are hard to imagine because they're down a long biochemical chain of events before what you breathe in actually serves the cell. So that's it's an interesting topic. But if people learn, for example, to breathe through their nose most of the time, they will have a benefit. And whether they can measure it or not, that's another thing. I can, I know how to measure what's going on in my uh, cellular breathing, but that's something I was trained to do. Uh, what's more important, uh, more significant uh, to each one is how do you feel? Do you feel better or not? Do you wake up refreshed after sleep or not? Uh, does your nose and sinuses, do they get clogged up while you're sleeping or do you wake up with that area clear and your mouth moist? So we have easy things to observe when it comes to breathing. Um, another thing is just looking at water. Water is a big topic on the planet today because we've interfered with natural water systems, redirected them, polluted them and so on. And it's not uncommon for people to either filter water or buy some kind of product that's been um, treated in a hopefully healthful way. So a century ago, the idea of buying water was, would have just been laughable. And now it's not even questioned. So we have a lot to think about if water is so fundamental to life how can we go so wrong? And what are we going to do? And then of course, you know that if somebody gives you a, a glass of water, 
happens in restaurants quite often where it's it's heavily chlorinated or fluoridated or something like that. And it just doesn't taste pleasant. So you're inclined to drink less. Whereas if it's really healthful water, it's easy to drink. So think about that. Your body is already telling you what it likes. You're not having to read a label. You're just asking the body. So that's an example where we're not talking chemistry here. We're talking noticing and having preferences that over time are more and more leading to health and balance. There is a natural inclination of the body to be, be energetic, be balanced, be able to rest, um, all those things. And if we look at animals in the wild, which are harder and harder to see, you'll see that they rest. They're always resting, but they're ready to act at a moment's notice. And sometimes, I notice this with, with dogs uh, as pets, that they tend to do the same thing. I'm not so sure about cats. Cats are a bit of a mystery to me, but dogs I understand more. <laughs> <laughs> so we learn, we learn from, <laughs> from observing others, including animals in this case. So when people say I'm healthy, they have their list of what they think promotes health. So energy, mental alertness, um, good appetite, ability to relax, movement without pain. These are just the kinds of things anyone can observe. And I'm suggesting that the more we pay attention to those things, the more we build what we could call a lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle. When you hear terms like diets and programs and protocols, those are short-term um, um, short term ways of learning new behavior. And sometimes that behavior becomes sustained and it just gets adopted as lifestyle. Sometimes people will do something like that for three weeks and then stop and go back to what they were doing before. So you won't hear me using those terms. I will be using lifestyle, way of eating, way of breathing, and more general terms because what I'm doing is sustainable for the long term. So that's very quick overview. There's lots of topics that can come up here and we'll get into that over time with articles and with uh, other live uh, interactions like this. So back to you, Adrian. <laughs> Well, I mean, Eric, that's uh, very helpful, fantastic, and and thanks for sharing. I think um, many people will be looking forward to hearing some of the specifics, and uh, obviously, um, right over on Blood Cancer Uncensored, um, the Planet Health segment will be being updated, and you can follow that over on Facebook as well, um, and on Twitter, and even on something called Tumblr, which I don't fully understand, but I think it's for young people, Eric, so there you go. Um, <laughs> I still haven't worked out Instagram, so if anyone can explain Instagram to me, then um, I'll be very grateful. Um, but in the meantime, um, thanks so very much for talking with us today, Eric, and I hope that's been enjoyable for people and something of a taster for, for what's to come as we all um, look at these things. And I've made a personal commitment, which um, I'm quite willing to go on camera to say, which I will personally assess every single one of the, uh, of the um, ideas that you put forward for myself and decide whether or not I want mm -hmm. to uh, enact them in my own life. Some of them I'll do, and I'm sure some of them I won't. Uh, certainly not if you tell me to stop eating meat, for example. But I hear you don't. I hear you like meat, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> or at least um, we'll some, some meat anyway. But we'll get there. No, but um, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, it's such a personal thing. And what I like about Eric, and I, I hope other people will, will see this over time, is that he's not a sort of evangelist about it. He's not someone who's going to try and force you into his particular model or try and sell you a book or try and uh, you know, tell you that you, if you don't do this thing, you're going to die or something. It's like, no, he's found some things that have helped him. He, he's going to offer them to us as things to think about and perhaps share some of the evidence behind some of them as well as in time. And um, we'll, we'll just um, take it as it goes. And hopefully we'll all feel a bit more healthy as a result. So thanks very much, Eric. We'll talk again soon. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot.